From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. With support from Genentech. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm your host, Chelsea Judge, Scientific Advisor with the CBJ Foundation. Today I'm going to really lean into my nerdy immunologist side and share some hot topics and emerging science that was presented at the recent virtual ectroms. What's ectroms? Only a really cool and important meeting where all the top clinicians and researchers join to talk science related to demyelinating disorders of the central nervous system, right? So your brain, your spinal cord, and the optic nerve. Officially, ECTRAM stands for the European Committee for Treatment and Research in MS, but it is not just MS. All the hottest science related to neurology and immunology with regard to diseases or disorders like MS and NMO are shared. It's like Paris Fashion Week, but for MS science nerds. So I'm going to break down four different buckets of info that was presented and try to keep it as simple and relevant as possible. So the who, what, where, when, and why, that kind of thing. So join me as I share with you um, as a scientist slash investigative reporter on the hottest emerging science related to NMOSD. First up, the one of four buckets, NMOSD and MOG associated disorders overlaps and distinctions. So who? This presentation was two parts. Part one was professor of neuropathology from Vienna, Dr. Romana Hofberger. And then we had Dr. Wingerchuk of the Mayo Clinic. The first one was the what? What are the differences in NMOSD and MOG in cohorts of patients? Why is this important? Well, we need to understand the nuances and differences in the disease processes of patients with NMOSD and or MOG to better under identify them, target, and treat. What was found or what was shared? So it seems like patients who have um, antibody to MOG versus not might also still have MOG T cells T cells are immune generals that can identify something that looks like this myelin, oligodendrocyte, glycoprotein, always a mouthful, versus patients who have the antibody, but not necessarily this other T cell specific response. So this in combination with age and other genetic factors of the patient is going to kind of give you the clinical presentation or, or how the disease looks or manifests. It's a spectrum. Dr. Wingerchuk nicely summarized the differences between AQP4 antibody disease and MOG antibody disease. So, right, you get antibody to this water channel protein, AQP4, or this myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, or MOG. So the target in AQP4 disease is the astrocyte. Astrocytes are these really important cells of your central nervous system that help uh, make up the blood-brain barrier. They provide lots of nourishment and support to neurons. They do a lot of important things. And so if you create an antibody against it, this can obviously cause major neurological issues as many NMO patients can tell you. So most patients with NMOSD will have this AQP4 antibody. However, some patients do not, but they may also have the MOG antibody. And like in the name myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, the main target of these antibodies is the myelin. The myelin is that fatty substance that coats your nerves and helps your nerves signal faster to each other. So if you damage the myelin, you have a weak or vulnerable neuron that's not going to signal or communicate as well. So obviously both can be very destructive neurologically. In AQP4 antibody disease, you see this in NMOSD, obviously, um, optic neuritis, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, right? So potentially leading to blindness and paralysis. And this is typically relapsing. And you see uh, potential other markers um, of inflammation as well within the cerebral spinal fluid. And you'll also see other mechanisms of disease like complement activation, this inflammatory immune cascade. Meanwhile, in MOG disease, yes, there's potential to see optic neuritis definitely, maybe longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis as well, but also tends to look more like this acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And it tends to either be monophasic, meaning happening just one time, or relapsing. Note, note that both of these are not progressive, like what we can see occur in multiple sclerosis. 
And in MOG disease, we typically see primary demyelination and other markers of inflammation as well as that complement again. Okay, so that's, that's some pretty nitty gritty science. What does this look like a little bit above the surface if we were going to just look at it as a whole group of people or the epidemiology? So in patients with NMOSD with that AQP4 antibody, we tend to have a greater risk in people um, of non-white descent, overwhelmingly female up to 90%, mostly adults. And um, we definitely know there's a pathogenic or bad or disease causing antibody, that AQP4 antibody. And there's a nice consensus diagnostic criteria for NMOSD patients with this AQP4 antibody. However, in MOG-associated diseases, we do not have a completely defined pathogenic antibody because maybe the MOG antibody itself isn't causing destruction in everyone. And there's no defined con consensus diagnostic criteria to date. And it tends to be slightly more female in MOG-associated disease and a higher proportion of childhood or pediatric events. So definitely important nuances to note. Okay, moving on to the second bucket, unraveling complexities of NMOSD. So this was another uh, two-part presentation with the first part being from Dr. Greenberg um, from Texas and Dr. Friedman Paul of Germany. This was a very, very um, nitty gritty scientific presentation with Dr. Greenberg presenting B cells and beyond in NMOSD. Basically, B cells are important immune cells of your body. I know many patients um, with NMO might be on something that depletes their B cells. So we know that this is an important um, treatment approach for NMOSD because B cells make antibody. And right, we know in a good or most chunk of patients with NMOSD, they have this bad or pathogenic antibody, um, that AQP4 antibody we just talked about that leads to the damage of those really important astrocytes. Or also MOG, right, that can cause demyelination as well. So it's a idea or approach to target B cells, eliminate them so you can't make more of this potential bad antibody. But because science is complicated and these diseases are very complicated, there's more to it than just B cells as we're learning. So it seems like there's also this uh, complement component and complement doesn't sound as complementary as you might think. Complement is an inflammatory immune cascade. We need it to help fight infections, especially bacterial infections. So it does good things. But in NMO, it seems like we have a lot of complement activated and it uh, deposits or collects within the CNS and that can be quote bad because it's inflammatory and it's causing destruction. And we see this relationship between antibodies and complement because they can kind of rev each other up or stimulate each other. And then at the same time, it's not just antibodies in this complement. It's antibodies and complement and cytokines, oh my. There's also these things called cytokines. Cytokines are cell messengers. You can kind of think of cytokines as hormones produced by immune cells. So they can direct each other to do certain actions and maybe even get to certain types of locations, but they're essentially cell messenger signals. And they can be very inflammatory at times. And it seems like in patients with NMO, we have more of these inflammatory cytokines, including this one called interleukin-6, that kind of helps rev up B cells to make more antibody and potentially can help rev up more of this inflammatory complement cascade. So you see a lot of factors going on. And while this is very overwhelming potentially, it's really cool because it gives scientists and clinicians more ideas and different treatment options. We had Dr. Paul presenting on disability in NMOSD, and what he shared with us, I think most patients will know all too well, be very intuitive, that disability is largely attack dependent in NMOSD, and there can be incomplete recovery from one attack, and they can be very quick, then they can be very brutal. And so this always highlights the need for effective acute treatment uh, management, and as well as preventative or maintenance therapy strategies highlighted various recommendations and guidelines um, with regard to first-line treatment with a big focus on potentially um, focusing on B-cell depleting treatments. And then he also gave recommendations for second and third-line therapies as well. And what they found is he did a nice 
nice review of FDA approved treatments. So we're looking at enobolizumab, satralizumab, and ecolizumab, all which have the ability to reduce relapses significantly. But we, importantly, he noted that there are no head-to-head -head trials or comparisons to these FDA approved treatments to each other. Um, and because there's differences in inclusion and exclusion criteria, like how the studies were designed and who, they were, who the therapies were studied in, we can't completely compare the medicines um, directly to each other. And then the third bucket, data updates on FDA approved treatments. First, enobolizumab, so this is targeting anti-CD19, monoclonal antibody to deplete B cells. Um, a presentation was given by Bruce Cree on safety and efficacy over about three years from the nmo Mentum trial. We know that enobolizumab significantly reduced risk of relapse, hospitalizations, and new lesion formation in the core trial. And we had a significantly reduced relapse rate with each year. Disability outcomes tended to be better with patients on nebulizumab versus placebo. And they noted that disability did not worsen over time. And that makes sense, right? If we just said that disability in NMOSD is largely relapse driven and we are significantly reducing relapses. They also noted that lesions on MRI were reduced on treatment and maintained low rates over time. Regarding safety, it was generally well tolerated over four years with a mean, mean uh, of years of about 3.2. They also noted that, that immunoglobulin levels, so your overall antibody levels, decreased over time, um, and there were no grade three or serious or worsening infections. Next up is ecolizumab, and this was presented by Dr. Nakashima of Japan on long-term safety and efficacy in ecolizumab and AQP4 NMOSD. So this is real-world evidence, so outside of clinical trial, um, and this is going to be observed up to seven years, and they're looking at effectiveness and the safety profile, um, looking at adverse events. So their data population was mostly female. They had NMOSD for about seven to eight years. And notably, because they're on ecolizumab, and this is going to block complement, um, they had to receive the meningococcal vaccine to help to make sure patients didn't potentially get exposed. They were overall generally well tolerated. There was no new safety signals. Um, everything was similar to results from the controlled study. Dr. Greenberg presented on satralizumab, discussed the latest long-term safety and efficacy in open-label extension studies. Satralizumab blocks that inflammatory cytokine, IL-6, and it significantly reduced relapse rates um, and also had positive safety profiles in the two core um, clinical trials. The results from this open-label extension, um, for up to four years, the safety profile was comparable to that double-blind or controlled period, and the rate of infections were also similar, and there was no anaphylaxis, and that all the injection-related reactions weren't serious. So overall, just had a favorable safety profile and no new safety findings were observed. And finally, the last bucket, neurodegeneration and demyelination in the central nervous system. Dr. Lubetzi presented on potential therapy or treatment targets in neuroregenerative processes. So this is how could we potentially help those neurons make more of themselves so that um, we could potentially help repair the neurons that are damaged in diseases like MS and NMO. He, gave a high level review of completed clinical trials and anything that had any kind of positive results where I, I butylast, clemestine, and antihistamine, and lipoic acid. So this is not to say that we know this for sure can help with neuro uh, regeneration, but that if anything can currently and has positive results from a completed clinical trial, these are what is available. They're also focused on these special stem cell-like cells, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, and how we could potentially make more of them. So why would we want them? These stem cells give us more oligodendrocytes, which is a mouthful, but this is an important type of cell because it makes myelin. And what gets destroyed in some parts, um, in some ways in NMO, the myelin. So if we can make more cells that can make more myelin, that being an important strategy or a cool strategy. Again, um, nothing completely readily available for patients to try it with regard to neuroregeneration, but there is a lot of um, research in this area and it does look hopeful. 
I hope you enjoyed this hot topics review from all of the available data regarding um, NMOSD that was just recently presented. And I hope you give us feedback. Tell us what was helpful. Tell us what we could do better and what you're interested in. And stay tuned for the next episode. It's going to be a two part on NMOSD diagnosis, clinical and patient perspectives. Thank you so much. Thank you.